just know that we're so, so blessed to have you here with us this morning. And we pray that this time of worship would be a blessing for you as well. This is God's house. He is the one who invites us into his presence. He's the one here to speak to us, to forgive us, to bless us, to feed us in the Lord's Supper. And he is eager to hear our praise this morning. So with that, we rise for confession and absolution. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O oh Lord, kept a record of sins, O oh Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore we are clear. Since we're gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let's first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let's take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner.
as the baptized people of God, we come into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Even though we are undeserving, 
In every trial and temptation, grant us steadfast confidence in your loving kindness and mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
continue to hear God's call in our lives. And today, the Lord's call is to share the good news of God's grace with everyone. In our Old Testament reading this morning, we hear God declare in no uncertain terms that His mercy and grace are available to all. No one is excluded, not even the ones we think should be excluded. God's grace is for all. And we see this all the more clearly in our gospel reading this morning as God's grace comes powerfully to a Canaanite woman and her daughter. God's grace is for all. And then in our epistle reading this morning, Paul hammers home this very same message. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience that he may have mercy on them all. Yes, beloved, God's grace is for all. So let's dig deeper. Our Old Testament reading this morning is from the prophet Isaiah, the 56th chapter. Beloved, very unfortunately, sometimes we as Christ followers can be rather narrow-minded and judgmental. We think we know who's in God's kingdom and who's not. Or at the very least, we think we know who should be in God's kingdom and who should not. But when we do that, we put ourselves in God's place, a place we should never, ever put ourselves. For God is God. His ways aren't our ways. How God sees things very often is different than the way we see things. How God works very often is different than the way we work. And one thing God makes absolutely clear in our Old Testament reading this morning is that His salvation is meant for all. In fact, our reading this morning is one of the most radical in all of Scripture. Why? Because in our reading this morning, the Lord speaks to two groups of outcasts, two groups God's people considered beyond the pale, two groups God's people thought never, ever could be part of God's people, part of God's salvation. But God says His salvation is for all. My salvation is close at hand, says the Lord. My righteousness will soon be revealed. But who's this salvation for? To whom will God's righteousness be revealed? God's answer takes our breath away. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, The Lord will surely exclude me from His people. And let no eunuch complain, I'm only a dry tree. Really, God? Foreigners and eunuchs? Your salvation includes foreigners and eunuchs? Your righteousness will be revealed to them too? Are you kidding me, God? And God's answer is an unequivocal yes. His salvation is meant for them too. God's grace is meant for all. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. To them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord, to minister to Him, to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all people. The Sovereign Lord declares, He who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. 
Beloved, today in our current context, it may be hard for us to understand why these words spoken by God himself are so earth-shattering, so radical. What's the big deal about foreigners and eunuchs? Now, beloved, I want you to close your eyes for a moment and think. Who are two groups of people that you are absolutely sure have no place in God's kingdom? Be honest with yourself. I'm not going to ask you to name these groups out loud. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I'm pretty sure all of us can name at least two groups we think will never, ever be part of God's kingdom. Then replace foreigners and eunuchs with the two groups you have in your mind. What does this do for how you hear this reading now? You see, beloved, it's pretty clear in Scripture that eunuchs aren't permitted to gather with God's people. Their bodies have been mutilated. Their genitals have been cut off, usually by conquering kings who then made them slaves in their royal courts. But even if they're set free, even if they return home, the mutilation remains. And that mutilation makes them ritually unclean. There's no place for them in the temple, lest they make the temple unclean by their presence. There's no place for them in the gathering of God's people, lest they make those around them unclean by their presence. So eunuchs were outcasts, kept on the fringes of society, just like lepers, never ever to have a place among God's people. And yet, here in our reading this morning, God speaks a great reversal into their lives. He promises them full inclusion in God's kingdom. He promises them something better than being able to have sons and daughters. He promises them an everlasting name that will endure forever. God's grace is for all. And then there's the foreigner. As God's people entered the promised land, the Lord told them not to have anything to do with the Moabites and Canaanites in particular. But over time, the people of Israel expanded this prohibition to include any and all foreigners. In fact, the Hebrew word used here for foreigner is an incredibly nasty word. Beloved, there are words today that we just don't say anymore because they're so, so nasty, so full of racist hatred. And in Hebrew, this is one of those words. All foreigners were considered an abomination. And yet, God speaks a great reversal to them too. He promises them a place in God's kingdom, a place on God's holy mountain. He promises them joy as he welcomes them into his temple to worship side by side with God's people because they're now his people too. God's grace is for all. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Yes, beloved, God's grace is for all. And that brings us to our gospel reading this morning in Matthew, the 15th chapter. Our gospel reading this morning opens with these words. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are on the Mediterranean coast of southern Lebanon. So these are the cities of foreigners. And Jesus is no stranger to Tyre and Sidon. In fact, earlier in Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus is speaking words of woe to the Jewish towns of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, 
because they had reacted so negatively to his ministry. Jesus said, For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. So when Jesus arrives here in Tyre and Sidon, you might just expect a positive response. At the very least, we see a positive response from this Canaanite woman in our reading. Notice how she greets Jesus. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter's demon-possessed and suffering terribly. First, she recognizes Jesus is Lord. Even as a foreigner, she recognizes he's the Messiah come from God. Second, she calls him Son of David. This title, Son of David, is Matthew's favorite title for Jesus. The very first words of Matthew's Gospel are these. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. Perhaps, just perhaps, this Canaanite woman calls Jesus Son of David because she's claiming an ancestral relationship with Jesus. After all, three of the women mentioned in Jesus' genealogy are Canaanite women, Rahab, Tamar, and Ruth. So this Canaanite woman's forebothers are Jesus' kinfolk. Finally, this woman ends her greeting with a cry. Have mercy on me. She recognizes Jesus as both the power and at least in the lives of others she's heard about, the willingness to show God's mercy to all those who approach him. Beloved, we heard God speak in our Old Testament reading this morning, a great reversal for both units and foreigners. And now we see another great reversal here in our Gospel reading. Earlier in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus had challenged his hearers to learn the ways of God's mercy. And now here in our reading, Jesus withdraws to a foreign place where the boundaries of God's mercy are going to be tested. Who's God's mercy and grace really for? Here in our reading this morning, we see a most remarkable faith in the most unexpected of places. And even animals are part of the story, and sheep and dogs provide images that are both suggestive and provocative. It doesn't take us very long to begin wondering, who are the sheep in this story? And who are the dogs? And what about the shepherd? caught in the middle of this story. Our English translations just aren't able to capture the antiphonal chorus contest Matthew sets up here, with the woman on one side and the disciples on the other. Although this Canaanite woman is indeed a foreigner, she speaks the language of an Israelite. She comes across as a God-fearer. Again and again she cries out for God's mercy. The Greek verb tense used here emphasizes repeated action. Again and again and again she cries out, Kyrie eleison, Lord, have mercy. On the other side of this antiphonal chorus, this woman's pleas are matched by the shouts of the disciples. Get rid of her! Get rid of her! With dramatic effect, Matthew sets this story before us with Jesus in the middle, flanked by two competing choruses. On this side, one lone woman crying, Kyrie eleison, and on the other side, this band of bullies shouting her down with get rid of her. How will Jesus respond? 
So, beloved, use your praying imaginations right now to enter this story yourselves. Gathered over here in this corner are those familiar disciples, the true blue representatives of the faithful lost sheep of Israel. Now jumping into the fray like so many ravenous dogs, seeing themselves as the self-appointed guardians of God's mercy and grace. God's mercy and grace should never be wasted on the unworthy. So like a gang of watchdogs at the door, they're checking IDs and keeping out the riffraff. And then over here in this corner stands a foreigner. An outsider, a woman no less, one lone representative of the dogs of religion, now become, as it were, a lost sheep, pleading plaintively for mercy from the Good Shepherd. Again, how will Jesus respond? We hear his words and gasp in unexpected horror. Did we really hear him correctly? Did Jesus just side with the bullies? But we need to listen to Matthew very carefully here. When Jesus said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel, Matthew makes it very clear Jesus is speaking to the disciples, not to the woman. But the woman won't be put off by Jesus' silence toward her. Lord, help me, she cries. This time Jesus speaks to her, not the disciples. And his words still sound like a rejection. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. These words seem so harsh. Many have tried to soften them, if not explain them away. But there's no softening them. There's no explaining them away. Jesus' words are clear and direct. But notice, beloved, this woman won't be put off. Her faith stands its ground. She won't take no for an answer. She doggedly stands her ground. She persistently asks for the Lord's help. Yes, it is, Lord, she says. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And with these words, we see another great reversal. Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. Indeed, God's grace is for all. And that brings us at last to our epistle reading this morning in Paul's letter to the Romans, the 11th chapter. Here in our reading this morning, Paul once more asks the very same question asked in our other two readings this morning. Who's got salvation for? In the chapters prior to our reading this morning, Paul's been wrestling with whether or not God's salvation no longer includes the Jews. In fact, in the opening words of our reading this morning, Paul gets right down to brass tacks, asking bluntly, has God rejected his people? And Paul's answer to this question is just as blunt. Our English translations typically say something like, by no means. But the Greek here is much, much more earthy and much more blunt. A more accurate translation of Paul's emotions here would be, Hell no! Absolutely not! No freaking way! And he uses his own life as proof. I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. And if God's grace could pierce his heart and heart, bringing him to faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, then what's true for him can be just as true for any other Jew. God has not rejected the Jews. God's grace is for all. Paul then goes on to affirm God's faithfulness. God always, always keeps his promises. For Paul, it's unthinkable that God 
couldn't keep his promises. Why? Because if God breaks his promises to Israel, then how can we as his Christ followers ever be sure God won't break his promises to us? And that's just unthinkable. God always keeps his promises to Jews and Gentiles alike. God's grace is for all. In fact, says Paul, that God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. That's just the way God is. God's mercy and grace win every time. Notice how Paul ends our reading this morning. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy in you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. In the end, God is merciful. His grace is for all. Now, humanly speaking, we might not understand how it's all going to work out. But God promises us it will work out. And it's His job, not ours, to make His promises work out. But what we know beyond all doubt is this. God is faithful. He always keeps his promises, and God's grace is for all. And the truth of this great good news causes Paul, in the verses immediately after our reading this morning, to break out into a song of praise for the wonder of God's mercy and grace that's ours in Jesus. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who's known the mind of the Lord? Or who's been his counselor? Who's ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And beloved, amen indeed. This is exactly where our reflections on God's faithfulness God's mercy and grace are supposed to take us to hymns of praise for the wonder of God's grace. Oh, beloved, God's grace is for all. Amen. Amen. We rise and speak the story of our faith using the words of the Lamb of the I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge all the living of the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Beloved, let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O 
Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning praying for your church, for this beloved community called Zion, for our Thursday evening Kings Hill ministry, for our brothers and sisters of in-town congregation, and for every gathering of your people in every nook and cranny of this planet. Father, we pray that this good news, that your mercy and grace is for all, would be forever in our hearts and on our lips. We pray that this good news, that you are always faithful, always keeping your promises, is something that we proclaim in every way possible. Lord, in your mercy, we pray this day for those in need. We pray especially for those experiencing homelessness, for those suffering from addiction, for those who are struggling with emotional issues. We pray for the person who broke into our building this past Monday. We pray that you would break into his heart somehow, some way that your mercy and grace would transform his life. We pray for our Afghan family. We give thanks for our endowment fund and for the gift they've provided for their rent for the next year. But we pray that you would also open every door this family needs, that they might do well here in this new home, so far from their homeland. We pray for those who are sick. We think especially of Kenny and Brian and Mick, Richard and Mark and Cindy and Jerry and Tracy and Melina and Marnie. We pray for the home for Dolly and Mark. We pray for those who are mourning. We pray especially for the families of Kurt Rubenhorst and Carrie Hancock's grandmother, Nancy, as they mourn the loss of their loved ones. Wrap your arms of love around all of these people. Hold them close to your heart. Assure them of your presence. Touch them with your healing hand. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Father, we pray for those who are celebrating today. We pray for those celebrating birthdays. We think especially of Elizabeth Hidden, whose birthday is today. For Anita Weber, for Brandon Punchwall, for Jerry Risberg and Mike Kirk. Curtis, whose birthdays are this week. We pray also for all of us that you would fill our hearts with thanksgiving for every good gift of grace you pour into our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And finally, oh Lord, we pray for our leaders. Give them wisdom. Give them the strength and the courage to use their authority wisely and well not passively, but to bring good for our entire community, our entire nation, our entire world. Lord, in your mercy. Your Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy and grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
we rise for the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he's now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saving you.
For those commuting in the pew, take eat. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take drink. This is the blood of Jesus shed for you. Now may this body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in true faith and the life everlasting. Go in his love, his joy, and his peace. Amen.
we rise to sing to the minutes. Jesus shall reign. 